Town is an amazing place to live. We have our urban centers where we can hang out with our friends, go to school, go to work. Um, we also have this phenomenal natural area. We can go see mountains outside of our windows. We can take walks along our creeks. We can go fishing in Lake Washington. My personal favorite is sea kayaking in the Puget Sound. It's just an amazing playground. Um, but it's not just a playground for us. Our natural environment supports all kinds of wildlife, be it tiny organisms in the soil to orca whales, the majestical creatures that we sometimes get to see as we're sea kayaking along. The problem is what, um, what is great for us and supports us is actually hurting the environment. And so green infrastructure, what I'm going to talk about today is how we can decrease our footprint on the downstream environment. Back in the day, long before we all lived here, this area was covered by dense evergreen forest. And so um, when it rained, which as you know, it does a lot of, so as the rain came down, the leaves would intercept the rain and slowly the water would work its way down to the soil. Then that topsoil or the organic, that loose fluffy soil at the top, slowly let the water sink in. And then eventually it would work its way back slowly to the creek, nice and clean, no pollutants. So that was, you know, 150 years ago. Then time goes on and we keep developing, you know, we cut down a few trees to put our house in, cut down a whole lot more. Then we need some roads to get from our house to our friend's house to the school. Then we develop cars and the cars drop pollutants. There's the oils, there's metals and brakes, there's all kinds of stuff that's coming from our cars onto the roads that's washing into our streams. So in the course of the last 150 years, we've gone from no impervious surface to up to 60% impervious surface. So what our creeks and our water bodies are experiencing has gone from slowly water feeding back to it to a fire hose effect. Um, so as um, about 15% of runoff of the rain would turn into runoff in the pre-developed condition back when it was all trees, now it's 50 to 70%. So every time it rains, that water is rushing down to our creeks. And that has a variety of problems that comes with it. Um, the pollutants, like I mentioned, um, those, those oils, it just washes off every time it rains. And you know, we've always thought there's a bit of a problem with that, with um, the organisms living in the creeks and in the sounds. You know, what, what are those impacts on, on the fish, for example? And recent studies have very clearly shown that if you take roadway runoff, maybe I think this study was off of I-5, taking the drainage off of I-5 or some highly traveled roadway, um, that runoff, when it goes, and if there was a fish trying to live in that water, it'll die within hours. Um, so that clearly shows there's something that is not helpful between what we do and the environment. Of course, we all kind of knew that, but people like to have science and numbers and things along those lines. Also, the thing that we do notice um, frequently, just every time it rains, is it gets kind of hard to travel from one place to another. If it's downpouring, um, sometimes the roadways are hard to travel through, great big puddles that block your way from your house to your, um, to your school or any other place you're trying to get to. That's inconvenient for us. It also, for the organisms downstream, um, is having all kinds of problems. So with um, some of our systems, it's combined sewage, and all that water rushes into a pipe, and the pipe can't handle it all and get all that water to um, wastewater treatment facilities, and it overflows. So we have some areas where there's combined sewage going into where people are swimming. Um, then there's also the impacts on the creek. So um, for example, a flow that a creek would see maybe only once a year is now five times higher than it used to be. So that's kind of like a fire hose blasting at the fish. Um, so as it's trying to swim upstream or it made a nice little nest where it has its eggs, the reds, um, it gets blasted out every time it rains. So that's the problem. The other part of the problem is that, or trying to figure out how to do a solution is that our systems are all complicated and there's a network of pipes underground and they all behave a little bit differently. So part of the steps of trying to solve the problem is knowing what, what impacts are happening in which places. And for the city of Seattle, we have about a third of the watershed where every time it rains, it goes straight to the sound. Um, so, or it goes from those rooftops and roadways to a creek and then to the sound or to the Lake Washington. We have other areas where it combine, does that combined sewage thing, where the same pipe system takes the water from when you flush your toilet as when, when it rains. And so that's called combined, combined um, sewer drainage systems. 
In the separated area, we have about, I think it's 15, it's on the slide, but I think it's 15 billion gallons of runoff that enters our receiving water bodies, Lake Washington, Puget Sound, um, over the course of the year. So from a scale, an Olympic-sized swimming pool is about a million gallons, a little less than that. So we're talking about thousands of um, Olympic-sized swimming pools of water polluted runoff going into the sound from our urban areas every year. And then in the combined sewer system, there's much less volume, but it's got whatever it is that we flush in the toilets also with it, you know, so it's not the greatest in the water quality. So that's our problem that we are, as the utility, Seattle Public Utilities, and every other utility in Western Washington and um, many other places, are all trying to figure out what is our part in trying to help reduce this footprint. Um, solution sets range, um, but as a whole, there's the conservation of an, our existing environment. So where we have those trees, we want to keep the trees. Um, there's also an ability to do street sweeping. So you just pick up those pollutants right where they fall. I mean, there's pollutants from other places than roads, but there's a large percentage of it right there on the road. Then we do infrastructure. Um, and the infrastructure could be uh, like the picture on the bottom right. Um, something very large, that's a combined sewer overflow storage tank that we placed, gigantic, um, and it's part of the tool set that's necessary um, if you can't do it all in the upland watershed. And the upland watershed approach is this green stormwater infrastructure, and that's what I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about. Because within the urban environment, um, we're getting less and less space, and we have to be more and more creative about our solution set. And so um, how we can meet multiple functions in one spot is um, one of the main aspects of green infrastructure. But the tool set of green infrastructure, you have to understand that a little bit. So we know what our problems are. Now we have to figure out what are the tools that we can apply. Um, one of the large ones most frequently used is bioretention. And really, it's take, you let the water drain into a low point in the watershed, or into um, your project area, and you hold the water. It might be two inches of water, six inches, maybe all the way up to a foot, but it's not very deep. You're holding water, and you're slowly letting it release back into the soil. Um, and that slowly reduces the total volume of water. It also cleans it. You take that polluted runoff off of I-5, you send it through bioretention soil, and the fish can swim in it and stay alive. So it's, it's a treatment as well as a slowing down of the soil. Sorry, slowing down of the water. Um, Rain gardens are another aspect of that. They're usually smaller scale from like one single family roof downspout. They're just a little less engineered. You don't have um, as much uh, overflow piping and um, uh, so engineered soils mixes, but it's a simplified version of bioretention. Permeable pavement, anywhere that you have to have hard surfaces, somewhere you wanna go play, um, a basketball court, anything that you need, a gathering space that's hard, maybe it's for your driveway, you can use permeable pavement. It lets the water go right through it. Kind of cool. It looks almost the same as concrete, but if you look closely, it looks a little bit more like a Rice Krispie treat, kind of smushed. Um, so you can identify it as you walk around. And then there's rainwater harvesting, or cisterns. So um, we're not talking about the little rain barrels. The little rain barrels don't do as much as we would hope. We need cisterns. Um, so you know, 205 gallons is about as small as um, makes sense for trying to control one downspout. Then there's ones that have extra cool benefits like green roofs, vegetated roofs. Um, think of looking out of a high rise building, which I work downtown in Seattle. If what I looked outside on was a bunch of green roofs, it would just be more pleasant, right? I don't like all of that um, just gray uh, rooftop kind of material. Um, and same with birds. So like as migratory habitat, having a green roof has this other value that there's other people using it. So there's that aesthetic and it slows water down. So from the stormwater standpoint, it helps in the stormwater side of things. And of course, trees, trees are good for all of us for all kinds of reasons. But again, that natural environment that was here before we got here. And finally, soil. Um, our development patterns, when we clear an area of all that nice topsoil that used to be here before um, development, we basically turn our lawns to function a lot like concrete. And so unless we do something to loosen it up, compost amend it, we're, we're, our lawn area is basically functioning like impervious area. So that's a bit about the toolbox, but then the toolbox you have to apply. And you have to figure out where could I put it, right? Like so you've got your big gigantic detention system, that can only happen at the end of a basin. But these green infrastructure suites can apply all kinds of different locations. So it could be, um, 
on a single family scale, like just at the residence, you know, just at a point of one roof, one house downspout, you can put in your cisterns or your rain gardens. You can have your single family driveway be permeable. You can also have that same suite of tools on a commercial scale, so it's just like a lot bigger, or at a school scale. Um, so it's the same tools, but they have a different look and shape and size. Um, also within each tool, like with us in the city, when we do large retrofit, we're um, looking in the city right of way a lot because almost a third of the city land mass is right of way. And so we have an ability to make a lot of change there. Those bioretention systems could be handling just that road. So we can have just a small amount of bioretention per block, or it could be having hundreds of acres flow through. We just put a project in um, over by REI, uh, South Lake Union area part of town. That's the bottom right picture. That's a bio, bioretention and biofiltration system. The water moves through there. It has hundreds of acres flowing through there before that water dumps into South Lake Union. So before you're, the, which is where there's lots of kayaking and um, paddle boarding and what have you. So um, lots of different ways to apply the tools. Then it's back to the complication of it. It sounds somewhat easy, right? It's like all kinds of different tools, all kinds of different sizes. But then you get to the fact that you are where there's lots of other people and lots of uses of that space. So in the right of way, you know, we're trying to fit in bike lanes, we're trying to fit in pedestrian walking routes. There's that whole mobility of the car thing that we have to figure out. Um, so there's this balance between parking and bioretention and people. And um, so how do you fit it all in? And that's where it gets extra complex. But this picture here is an example of, of one way to fit it all in. And so you've got permeable pavement under where people are parking. Um, so you still have that parking space. And then you have um, an ability to make the roadway crossings smaller, shorter for pedestrians um, by putting the bioretention kind of near the curb bulb. Um, and so you're just, you know, you're using your different tools as you can uh, within the space and trying to manage as much impervious surface within that area. And we like to think of it as just smarter technology. You know, we used to have single use. We used to have pipes. The pipe's job was to get the water from the impervious surface quickly and as um, efficiently away elsewhere. And now we need our conveyance systems to do more than just get it away. We need to slow it down. We need to treat it. We also need to figure out multiple functions of like, well, can this also create an aesthetic amenity? Can it also create habitat for birds? And so. Um, the green infrastructure suite is trying to figure out all those multiple uses and how to piece it together. And it's hard. Um, it's super hard. And so we went to our management to say, this is taking a lot of staff time to try to figure out. It's expensive to try to retrofit, retrofit an urban area. Do you want us to do this? Um, and we went up the management chain, um, honestly. Like this is taking all city departments to coordinate with each other because all the codes and policies are written for something that was um, for rules 30 years ago. So we're having to look at, um, you know, all kinds of different land use codes, right away improvement uh, requirements, um, the whole suite of um, ways that government approves or doesn't approve projects. And so we said, do you, are you sure you want us to do this? Because <laughs> it's hard, but it's totally important, but we want to get support. And our elected officials said, not only do we want you to do it, we want you to do way more than you thought. And so right now we're at a place where we're managing about 100 million gallons per year. Remember we have 16 billion gallons leaving every year. Um, so there's like a lot of room to grow. Um, and so they set us on a trajectory to like, how can you really push yourselves to do as much as possible? And um, the goal is that at the population at 2025, will be managing 1,000 gallons per capita. So for every person that lives in Seattle at 2025, we want to be managing 1,000 gallons. Um, so we're doing that in a variety of different ways. Um, there's those projects that we do as the city, our own capital improvement projects. There's requirements of others. Um, there was the state, statewide, there's actually been a lot of changes to require low impact development, green infrastructure. Um, and so those tools will help as new development happens. But then there's all that development that's been there for years. And so we're looking at incentives to help encourage people, either financial incentives or also just um, assistance in helping work through the regulatory process. So we have a target um, and it's, um, it's definitely a stretch target. It's gonna be hard for us to hit it. Um, again, as we're looking at how do we apply those tools, we're taking 
uh, the bioretention suite, so when we're in areas that have water quality is the primary goal, um, so all those areas that go straight to, the, to Lake Washington or the Sound, we're looking at water quality treatment approaches. And then areas where there's also a need for slowing the water down, be it in the combined sewer system or anything that goes to a creek watershed or anything that goes to where there's flooding downstream, there's where we're trying to look at slowing down the water. And um, in some parts of the city, we've already um, put into place a um, incentive. So it's called RainWise, and King County offers this as well within the city of Seattle. And that RainWise website, 700milliongallons.org slash RainWise, um, we offer cash rebates back to people who retrofit their, their homes. Because um, really, it's going to take all of us together. So it's going to take the city doing their part, the county doing their part, um, all the new development, but also us trying to manage um, proactively because we know it's the right thing to do. And this is an example, so if people want to help do their part of um, how do you manage a 1,000 gallons? Like, what does that look like? And so my challenge for you all is to think about can you get these strategies in on your property or wherever you live or in within your neighborhood? Um, it could be a rain garden, um, and the font is too small for me at the moment, but um, I think it's six by six, uh, so it's not very much. You know, you're trying to manage 70 square feet of impervious surface per person. And if we do that, we'll, we'll get a lot closer to making our impact um, on our downstream wildlife uh, a little less. Um, so as a whole, you know, we're trying to take all that water and instead of quickly sending it downstream and having those impacts of flooding the creeks and actually having big impacts also on um, humans and their mobility, to holding it back distributed within the watershed. And that is our charge. And we would like as much help uh, as anyone is willing to give us. Thank you.